Islamic military jurisprudence refers to what has been accepted in Sharia Islamic law and fiqh Islamic jurisprudence by ulama Islamic scholars as the correct Islamic manner which is expected to be obeyed by Muslims in times of war. Some scholars and Muslim religious figures claim that armed struggle based on Islamic principles is referred to as the lesser jihad. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Development of rulings. The first military rulings were formulated during the first century after Muhammad established an Islamic state in Medina. These rulings evolved in accordance with the interpretations of the Quran, the Islamic holy scriptures, and hadith, the recorded traditions, actions, behaviors, sayings and consents of Muhammad. The key themes in these rulings were the justness of war, harb, and the injunction to jihad. The rulings do not cover feuds and armed conflicts in general. Jihad Arabic for struggle was given a military dimension after the oppressive practices of the Meccan Quraysh against Muslims. It was interpreted as the struggle in God's cause to be conducted by the Muslim community. Injunctions relating to jihad have been characterized as individual as well as collective duties of the Muslim community. Hence, the nature of attack is important in the interpretation. If the Muslim community as a whole is attacked jihad becomes incumbent on all Muslims. Jihad is differentiated further in respect to the requirements within Muslim governed lands Dar al -Islam and non Muslim lands. Dar al -Harb. According to Shaheen Sardar Ali and Javed Rahman, both professors of law, the Islamic military jurisprudence are in line with rules of modern international law. They point to the dual commitment of Organization of Islamic Cooperation OIC member states representing most of the Muslim world to Islamic law and the United Nations Charter, as evidence of compatibility of both legal systems. <laughs> <laughs> Ethics of warfare Fighting is justified for legitimate self-defense, to aid other Muslims and after a violation in the terms of a treaty, but should be stopped if these circumstances cease to exist. The principle of forgiveness is reiterated in between the assertions of the right to self-defense. During his life, Muhammad gave various injunctions to his forces and adopted practices toward the conduct of war. The most important of these were summarized by Muhammad's companion and first caliph, Abu Bakr, in the form of ten rules for the Muslim army. O people! I charge you with ten rules, learn them well. Stop, O people, that I may give you ten rules for your guidance in the battlefield. Do not commit treachery or deviate from the right path. You must not mutilate dead bodies. Neither kill a child, nor a woman, nor an aged man. Bring no harm to the trees, nor burn them with fire, especially those which are fruitful. Slay not any of the enemy's flock, save for your food. You are likely to pass by people who have devoted their lives to monastic services, leave them alone. According to Tabari, the ten bits of advice that Abu Bakr gave was during the expedition of Usama bin Zayd. During the Battle of Sifan, the Caliph Ali stated that Islam does not permit Muslims to stop the supply of water to their enemy. In addition to the Rashidun caliphs, hadiths attributed to Muhammad himself suggest that he stated the following regarding the Muslim conquest of Egypt that eventually took place after his death. You are going to enter Egypt a land where karat money unit is used. Be extremely good to them as they have with us close ties and marriage relationships. When you enter Egypt after my death, recruit many soldiers from among the Egyptians because they are the best soldiers on earth, as they and their wives are permanently on duty until the day of resurrection. Be good to the Copts of Egypt, you shall take them over, but they shall be your instrument in help. Be righteous to God about the Copts. These principles were upheld by Amr ibn al as during his conquest of Egypt. A Christian contemporary in the 7th century, John of Nikiu, stated the following regarding the conquest of Alexandria by Amr. On the 20th of Mascarum, Theodore and all his troops and officers set out and proceeded to the island of Cyprus, and abandoned the city of Alexandria. And thereupon Amr the chief of the Moslem made his entry without effort into the city of Alexandria. And the inhabitants received him with respect, for they were in great tribulation and affliction. And Abba Benjamin, the patriarch of the Egyptians, returned to the city of Alexandria in the thirteenth year after his flight from the Romans, and he went to the churches, and inspected all of them. And every one said, This expulsion of the Romans and victory of the Moslem is due to the wickedness of the emperor Heraclius and his persecution of the Orthodox through the patriarch Cyrus. 
This was the cause of the ruin of the Romans and the subjugation of Egypt by the Moslem. And Amr became stronger every day in every field of his activity. And he exacted the taxes which had been determined upon, but he took none of the property of the churches, and he committed no act of spoliation or plunder, and he preserved them throughout all his days. The principles established by the early caliphs were also honored during the Crusades, as exemplified by sultans such as Saladin and al Kamil. For example, after al Kamil defeated the Franks during the Crusades, Olivares Scholasticus praised the Islamic laws of war, commenting on how al Kamil supplied the defeated Frankish army with food. Who could doubt that such goodness, friendship, and charity come from God? Men whose parents, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, had died in agony at our hands, whose lands we took, whom we drove naked from their homes, revived us with their own food when we were dying of hunger and showered us with kindness even when we were in their power. The early Islamic treatises on international law from the 9th century onwards covered the application of Islamic ethics, Islamic economic jurisprudence and Islamic military jurisprudence to international law, and were concerned with a number of modern international law topics, including the law of treaties, the treatment of diplomats, hostages, refugees and prisoners of war, the right of asylum, conduct on the battlefield, protection of women, children and non-combatant civilians, contracts across the lines of battle, the use of poisonous weapons weapons, and devastation of enemy territory. Criteria for soldiering Muslim jurists agree that Muslim armed forces must consist of debt-free adults who possess a sound mind and body. In addition, the combatants must not be conscripted, but rather enlist of their free will, and with the permission of their family. Legitimacy of war Muslims have struggled to differentiate between legitimate and illegitimate wars. Fighting in self-defense is not only legitimate but considered obligatory upon Muslims, according to the Quran. The Quran, however, says that should the enemy's hostile behavior cease, then the reason for engaging the enemy also lapses. Some scholars argue that war may only be legitimate if Muslims have at least half the power of the enemy and thus capable of winning it. Other Islamic scholars consider this command only for a particular time. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Defensive conflict. According to the majority of jurists, the Quranic cases belly justification of war are restricted to aggression against Muslims and fitna, persecution of Muslims because of their religious belief. They hold that unbelief in itself is not the justification for war. These jurists therefore maintain that only combatants are to be fought, noncombatants such as women, children, clergy, the aged, the insane, farmers, serfs, the blind, and so on are not to be killed in war. Thus, the Hanafi ibn Najim states, "...the reason for jihad in our the Hanafis view is kanuam harba alayna, literally, their being at war against us." The Hanafi jurists al-Shaybani and al-Sarikshi state that, Although kufr unbelief in God is one of the greatest sins, it is between the individual and his God the Almighty and the punishment for this sin is to be postponed to the Dar al-Jazza, the abode of reckoning, the hereafter." War, according to the Hanafis, can't simply be made on the account of a nation's religion. Abdulaziz Sashadina argues that the original jihad according to his version of Shiism was permission to fight back against those who broke their pledges. Thus the Quran justified defensive jihad by allowing Muslims to fight back against hostile and dangerous forces. Topic: <inaudible> Offensive conflict. Muhammad ibn Idris Ash Shafi'i d. 820, founder of the Shafi'i school of thought, was the first to permit offensive jihad, limiting this warfare against pagan Arabs only, not permitting it against non-Arab non-Muslims. This view of al-Shafi'i is mitigated by the fact that an opposite view, in agreement with the majority, is also attributed to al-Shafi'i. Javed Ahmad Ghamidi believes that after Muhammad and his companions, there is no concept in Islam obliging Muslims to wage war for propagation or implementation of Islam. The only valid basis for military jihad is to end oppression when all other measures have failed. Islam only allows jihad to be conducted by a government. According to Abdulaziz Sashadina, offensive jihad raises questions about whether jihad is justifiable on moral grounds. 
He states that the Quran requires Muslims to establish just public order, increasing the influence of Islam, allowing public Islamic worship, through offensive measures. To this end, the Quranic verses revealed required Muslims to wage jihad against unbelievers who persecuted them. This has been complicated by the early Muslim conquests, which he argues were although considered jihad by Sunni scholars, but under close scrutiny can be determined to be political. Moreover, the offensive jihad points more to the complex relationship with the people of the book. Some major modern scholars who have rejected the idea of offensive jihad include the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, Hassan al-Banna (1906–1949), the Al-Azhar scholar Muhammad Abu Zara (1898–1974), who thought that military jihad is permitted only to remove aggression, udwin, and religious persecution, fitna, against Muslims. As well as Syrian scholars Muhammad said Ramadan al bauti (1929–2013) and Waba al zuhaili (1932–2015), the latter saying that peace is the underlying principle of relations between Muslims and non-Muslims. Al zuhaili maintains that this view is supported by 8 to 61, as well as 2 to 208 and 4 to 94, that establish the principle of international peace. For him, Muslims should be committed to peace and security on the basis of 4 to 90 and 60 to 8. Topic: International conflict. International conflicts are armed strifes conducted by one state against another and are distinguished from civil wars or armed strife within a state. Some classical Islamic scholars, like the Shafi'i, classified territories into broad categories: Dar al-Islam, abode of Islam; Dar al-Harb, abode of war; Dar al-Ahd, abode of treaty; and Dar al-Sul, abode of reconciliation. Such categorizations of states, according to Asma Afsaridin, are not mentioned in the Quran and Islamic tradition. Topic: <laughs> Declaration of War. The Quran commands Muslims to make a proper declaration of war prior to the commencement of military operations. Thus, surprise attacks are illegal under the Islamic jurisprudence. The Quran had similarly commanded Muhammad to give his enemies, who had violated the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, a time period of four months to reconsider their position and negotiate. This rule, however, is not binding if the adversary has already started the war. Forcible prevention of religious practice is considered an act of war. Topic. Conduct of armed forces During battle the Quran commands Muslims to fight against the enemy. However, there are restrictions to such combat. Burning or drowning the enemy is allowed only if it is impossible to achieve victory by other means. The mutilation of dead bodies is prohibited. The Quran also discourages Muslim combatants from displaying pomp and unnecessary boasting when setting out for battle. According to Professor Saeed Damad, no explicit injunctions against use of chemical or biological warfare were developed by medieval Islamic jurists as these threats were not existent then. However, Khalil al Maliki's book on jihad states that combatants are forbidden to employ weapons that cause unnecessary injury to the enemy, except under dire circumstances. The book, as an example, forbids the use of poisonous spears, since it inflicts unnecessary pain. Topic. Civilian areas According to al Madabs, it is not permissible to kill women or children unless they are fighting against the Muslims. The Hanafi, Hanbali, and Maliki schools forbid killing of those who are not able to fight, including monks, farmers, and serfs, as well as mentally and physically disabled. Harming civilian areas and pillaging residential areas is also forbidden, as is the destruction of trees, crops, livestock, and farmlands. The Muslim forces may not loot travelers, as doing so is contrary to the spirit of jihad. Nor do they have the right to use the local facilities of the native people without their consent. If such a consent is obtained, the Muslim army is still under the obligation to compensate the people financially for the use of such facilities. However, Islamic law allows the confiscation of military equipment and supplies captured from the camps and military headquarters of the combatant armies. Negotiations 
Commentators of the Quran agree that Muslims should always be willing and ready to negotiate peace with the other party without any hesitation. According to Madhudi, Islam does not permit Muslims to reject peace and continue bloodshed. Islamic jurisprudence calls for third party interventions as another means of ending conflicts. Such interventions are to establish mediation between the two parties to achieve a just resolution of the dispute. Topic. Ceasefire In the context of 7th century Arabia, the Quran ordained Muslims must restrain themselves from fighting in the months when fighting was prohibited by Arab pagans. The Quran also required the respect of this ceasefire, prohibiting its violation. If, however, non Muslims commit acts of aggression, Muslims are free to retaliate, though in a manner that is equal to the original transgression. The sword verse which has attracted attention, is directed against a particular group who violate the terms of peace and commit aggression, but accepts those who observe the treaty. Crone states that this verse seems to be based on the same above-mentioned rules. Here also it is stressed that one must stop when they do. Ibn Kathir states that the verse implies a hasty mission of besieging and gathering intelligence about the enemy, resulting in either death or repentance by the enemy. It is read as a continuation of previous verses, it would be concerned with the same oath-breaking of polytheists. Topic. Prisoners of war Men, women, and children may all be taken as prisoners of war under traditional interpretations of Islamic law. Generally, a prisoner of war could be, at the discretion of the military leader, executed, freed, ransomed, exchanged for Muslim prisoners, or kept as slaves. In earlier times, the ransom sometimes took an educational dimension, where a literate prisoner of war could secure his or her freedom by teaching ten Muslims to read and write. Some Muslim scholars hold that a prisoner may not be ransomed for gold or silver, but may be exchanged for Muslim prisoners. Women and children prisoners of war cannot be killed under any circumstances, regardless of their religious convictions, but they may be freed or ransomed. Women who are neither freed nor ransomed by their people were to be kept in bondage, also referred to as malaka, however dispute exists among scholars on the term's interpretation. Islamic law does not put an exact limit on the number that can be kept in bondage. Topic. Internal conflict Internal conflicts include civil wars launched against rebels, and wars for welfare launched against bandits. During their first civil war, Muslims fought at the Battle of Basora. In this engagement, Ali the Caliph, set the precedent for war against other Muslims, which most later Muslims have accepted. According to Ali's rules, wounded or captured enemies should not be killed, those throwing away their arms should not be fought, and those fleeing from the battleground should not be pursued. Only captured weapons and animals horses and camels which have been used in the war are to be considered war booty. No war prisoners, women or children are to be enslaved and the property of the slain enemies are to go to their legal Muslim heirs. Different views regarding armed rebellion have prevailed in the Muslim world at different times. During the first three centuries of Muslim history, jurists held that a political rebel may not be executed nor his, her property confiscated. Classical jurists, however, laid down severe penalties for rebels who use stealth attacks and spread terror. In this category, Muslim jurists included abductions, poisoning of water wells, arson, attacks against wayfarers and travelers, assaults under the cover of night and rape. The punishment for such crimes were severe, including death, regardless of the political convictions and religion of the perpetrator. Further, rebels who committed acts of terrorism were granted no quarter. Topic see also Islam and War Geneva Conventions Hague Conventions Rule of Law in Armed Conflicts Project RULAC Itmam i Hujat Laws of War Opinion of Islamic Scholars on Jihad Islamic Military Alliance Topic Notes Topic References Abul Enan, H. Yusuf, Zuhar, Sharifa, Islamic Rulings on Warfare, Strategic Studies Institute, U.S. Army War College, Diane Publishing Co., Darby PA, ISBN 1-4289-1039-5 Abu Nimer, Muhammad 2000-2001. A Framework for Nonviolence and Peacebuilding in Islam. Journal of Law and Religion 15 one -half. Retrieved on 5 August 2007. Ali, Abdullah Yusuf 1991. The Holy Quran. Medina, King Fahd Holy Quran and Printing Complex. 
Charles, Robert H. 2007 The Chronicle of John, Bishop of Nikiu, translated from Zotenberg's Ethiopic text. Merchantville, N.J., Evolution Publishing. Damod, Saeed Mustafa Mahakik et al., 2003. Islamic Views on Human Rights. Tehran, Center for Cultural International Studies. Crone, Patricia 2004. God's Rule, Government and Islam. New York, Columbia University Press. Javed Ahmad Ghamidi, Mizan 2001. The Islamic Law of Jihad, Dar al Ishraq. OCLC 52901690 Nicola Malise, Tratato Sula Gera. Il Kitab al Jihad di Mola Husrav, AIPSA, Colliery 2002. Madeline, Wilford. The Succession to Muhammad, A Study of the Early Caliphate. Cambridge University Press. ISBN 0 521 64696 0. Madudi, Saeed Abul Allah. The Meaning of the Quran. Lahore, Islamic Publications. Madudi, Saeed Abul Allah. Human Rights in Islam. Islamabad, Dawa Academy. M. Mukarram Ahmed, Muzaffar Hussain Syed, ed. 2005. Encyclopedia of Islam. On Mole Publications Private. Limited. ISBN 81-261-2339-7. Islam Question and Answer, 3. Ruling on having intercourse with a slave woman when one has a wife Islam Question and Answer, 4. Husband forcing his wife to have intercourse Topic Further reading Qadori, Majid 1955. War and Peace in the Law of Islam. Johns Hopkins Press. ISBN 1-58477-695-1. Hashmi, ed. Suhil H. 2002. Islamic Political Ethics, Civil Society, Pluralism, and Conflict. Princeton University Press. ISBN 0-691-11310-6. CS1 maint, Extra Text, Authors List link, Malik, S.K. 1986. The Quranic Concept of War PDF. Himalayan Books. ISBN 81-7002-020-4. Swaroop, Ram Understanding Islam through Hadis. Voice of Dharma. ISBN 0-682-49948-X. Topic external links Islamic texts on the rules of war The Quran and War, Observations on Islamic Just War Defending the Transgressed by Censuring the Reckless Against the Killing of Civilians Islam Q&A, Treatment of Prisoners of War in Islam IslamToday.net, Islamic Law and Prisoners of War Directives of Islam Regarding Jihad The Rules of War According to Islam, Web.org. UK does the Quran really sanction violence against unbelievers? By Sheikh Kabir Helminski, The Huffington Post. Jihad and the Islamic Law of War.